I'd like to begin by thanking you and Dean for organizing such a wonderfully eclectic workshop in such a lovely um, venue. Typically, we regard ourselves to be finite, embodied beings in a space. During our working, uh, waking hours, we constantly direct our attention to aspects of the world that we wish to learn about, and then our sensory organs provide stream of information about our surroundings. And that data is then dynamically incorporated into a predictive model of the world, of, our, of, our, of the world and our surroundings. That predictive model then provides us with the ability to make limited predictions about the future. And we know very well that that model is fundamentally limited, even in the most familiar situations we initially encounter, we know that it's very difficult to predict exactly what will happen. So in this kind of folk uh, model of reality, um, the concept of information plays a very basic role. We fully accept that our knowledge about the world, the immediate surroundings, is limited. We also accept that our predictive model is limited, both because we lack complete information about what's going on around us, and because we lack complete understanding or accurate model of how reality actually unfolds. So we have this everyday view. In contrast to that, in the, in the mechanistic conception that underlies classical physics, the concept of information plays no fundamental approach. So in this mechanistic world view, and this is Newton's conception summarized, everything that exists is matter which moves on fixed stage of space according to deterministic, reversible, universal quantitative laws in step with the universal time. In principle, one can probe this matter as precisely as one wishes without disturbing its nature or motion. Reality is such that it's, con it's constructed in such a way that through such probings, one can, in principle, discover the underlying force of motion. Abstractly, we could say, what is the abstract framework within which we build classical physical theories? Abstractly, we have a state space. Dynamics are represented by one-to-one -one maps over the state space, which are also reversible. And there exists, we can perform measurements to learn about these states. And in principle, there are measurements which tell us exactly what the state of the system is. So we can summarize as follows the basic as you were, elements of this framework of states, dynamics, and the notion of an ideal measurement here. And these measurements are non-disturbing, ideally. And also this rather crucial feature that composite systems can be viewed as simply um, as it were, composites of individual systems, and so the state of the composite system can be specified by just specifying the states of the individual systems. This is crucial because it means that finite beings like ourselves can study the universe in pieces and, 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 and then you know, aggregate that knowledge of the pieces and form a knowledge of the whole, and we don't lose anything in that process. It's rather crucial. So we can contrast everyday experience the folk model of everyday experience. And in that framework, agents have a fundamentally information restricted view of the present state of reality and of future events. So the concept of information there is fundamental because information arises whenever there's a tension between something that exists or we think that exists and what we know about what exists. In the mechanical conception, we have a very different picture. Every agent, in principle, ideally, has a God's eye view of the state of the system and can aspire to perfect predictive power. And so the concept of information is redundant at the fundamental level. But what I mean by that is that there's no distinction between what an agent ideally knows and what exists. And if there's no distinction, then why maintain a distinction in the sense so that they collapse onto one another? And so one has perfect information about the present, in principle, and future events. Now, the mechanical conception of reality obviously didn't go unchallenged for the 200 plus years that it provided the foundation for physical theories. It was challenged, as it were, internally through the development of physical theories, through the development of things like Maxwell's electrodynamics and thermodynamics and relativity, which stretched this framework in various ways. 
But I would say it didn't break it. It didn't break that framework. The framework could be stretched to accommodate these innovations within physics. The, the view, though, the mechanical conception was challenged at a philosophical level, all kinds of philosophical from all kinds of philosophical positions. I would just mention that critique of Ernst Mach, which turned out to be historically obviously very important for the development of physics. So this is the quote that we all know. The goal of which it, physical science, has set itself is the simplest and most economical abstract expression of facts. So he's really pointing to the facts of our experience or experimental facts as really the ultimate basis for our theoretical conceptions. He was pointing at things like absolute space and critically questioning whether we should take that so literally. This quote, I think, is very lovely to sort of give the, the broader picture. Immensely separating the body from the changeable environment in which it moves, what we really do is to extricate a group of sensations on which our thoughts are fastened and which is of relatively greater stability than the others from the stream of all our sensations. Suppose we were to attribute the, to nature the property of producing like effects in like circumstances. Just these like circumstances we should not know how to find. Nature exists once only. Our schematic mental imitation alone produces like events. And I find that a very striking uh, quotation. He's really questioning the whole foundation of the mechanistic conception of reality. But as we know, the, the deepest challenge of the mechanistic conception came from, as it were, an organic development of physics itself, namely through quantum theory. So in quantum theory, we have an entirely different abstract framework in which we build physical theories. We have similar ideas, space, <coughs> dynamics, measurements, and composite systems, but the, the formalization is radically different. So states are represented by vectors in a complex vector space. Dynamics are still one-to-one, -one, but there's a, a great deal of non-triviality here. How we represent measurements, and how we represent composite systems are fundamentally different. So let me try to unpack this with an example. So just consider the quantum measurement process. Think of a a measurement here of the magnetic moment of the particles. So just think of this as a black box that, in a classical setting, simply recalls, tells us the Z component of that vector. And if we you know, rotate the Stoker device, we will accordingly measure a different component of that vector. Now, this vector can take any direction in space, and accordingly, the outcomes of the Stoker device form a continuum. And they're deterministic. They're determined by the direction of this arrow. So that's the classical picture of this system. Now what happens if we do this experiment on electrons? So we have a source of silver atoms, and when we send them through this device, we find that all of the outcomes cluster around just two locations on the screen. And that's true even if we then rotate this device, which is extraordinary from a classical point of view. And so we can actually throw away the screen entirely and just put a couple of detectors there instead. And so we can do that. We have our little detectors. We have here our silver atom. And what quantum theory says is that the, you know, the deep theoretical description of this is that there really are just two, out what two possible outcomes of this, of this measurement. In each trial, we simply get a one or a two. So we end up with this discrete data stream. And this discretization is fundamental. It's not something that's an approximation to some continuum underlying reality, at least if you take the formalism of quantum theory at face value. Now, these outcomes are only determined probabilistically by the state, this is the state. And so we have this very interesting situation as we run this experiment n times, a finite number of times. What we learn about is the frequency of outcome 1 and the frequency of outcome 2. But this only gives us finite information about p1 and p2. So we actually, there's a, there's a fundamental gap here between what we can know through a finite number of measurements, which is all that we can actually do, of course. Um, the state of the system. Not only that, but if we perform the same measurements, if we perform this measurement to get this outcome, and then we do the measurement again, we must get the same outcome again for these repeatable measurements. What this tells us is that the state of the system after the first measurement is now different to what it was before. In fact, we can predict exactly what it, what it is on the basis of our data. So what it means is that this second measurement provides no more information 
that we already have about the original state. So in practice, we have to have many copies of the same system prepared in the same state if we want to learn about the state. And finally, as we can see here, the data that we get from this experiment only tell us about P1 and P2. It doesn't tell us about phi1 and phi2 at all. So the measurement provides only information about certain degrees of freedom at the expense of the others. And this is one way of formalizing Bohr's notion of complementarity. And one can generalize this to an n-dimensional system, trivial. So to summarize, in a quantum model of measurement, uh, there are measurements whose outcomes are, are discrete, a finite number of possible outcomes. So we have at the basic level the idea that data, at least sometimes, is a bit stream. Outcomes are probabilistic. Because of that, a finite number of measurements only give finite information about the state, just like trying to predict the bias of a coin by tossing it a dozen times. You only have limited information of the bias of the coin. Nothing more than that. And you also have, even if you know the state, you only have finite information about what outcome will later be obtained. And because of complementarity, it's not enough to do just one type of measurement on quantum systems. You have to, to do a number of different measurements to build up the quantum state. That's if you restrict yourself to repeatable measurements. So we can contrast classical measurements with quantum measurements. So this we've already seen. And so because of the probabilistic nature of outcomes and complementarity, agents, we're now talking about ideal agents in the quantum framework, have an informationally restricted view of both the state of the system and given the state of future measurement outcomes. So I would say here that information is, is playing a very fundamental role. It's an absolutely natural concept, just as it is in our everyday folk conception of reality. So this is quantum theory. What, what happened after quantum theory? Well, this is a sort of a timeline that this picks out a few interesting things. Events which are important because they, they, they bring information into our thinking about reality, physical reality at a fundamental level. So I think only, I only have time just to say a few words. We have Szilard's analysis of Maxwell Stephen, for example, which brought into question the idea that measurement is somehow some odd, some very passive process. So essentially, the idea is that measurement has a thermodynamic cost. It's a physical process. We have to describe measurement itself within our ordinary physical description of the world. We can't think of it as something external that somehow peers in and passively registers what's there. Um, I mentioned the Aturian model of computation. Uh, this <coughs> Shannon's theory of information was very crucial in mathematizing this, this quantitative notion of information, at least in a limited context. Ed James showing how you could derive um, formalism of statistical mechanics using the concept of information. Landau's Eurasian hypothesis, Bell's theorem, bipolar entropy, and one can go on and on here. And crucially, from around 1980, you have this extraordinary um, emergence of this field of quantum information and quantum computation. And what it's demonstrated over 30 years very clearly is that it's extraordinarily fruitful to think about quantum theory from an information point of view, to ask, how do you store information? How do you communicate information? How do you process information within that framework? How is, that, what, how is what is possible in that framework different from what is possible in a classical framework? So as a result, I think of quantum theory primarily and then many developments since then, we have emerging an informational view of nature. And I think it's best expressed in, in this work by John Wheeler. It forbids, symbolizes the idea that every item of the physical world has at bottom, at very deep bottom in most instances, an immaterial source and explanation. That, what we call reality, arises in the last analysis from the posing of yes no questions and the registering of equipment evoked responses. In short, that all things physical are information theoretic in origin, and this in a participatory universe. A very Marxian quote, 
what we call reality consists of a few fine posts of observation between which we fill an elaborate papier mache of imagination and theory. So the claim here is something very deep, that information is as fundamental as the classical notions of space, time, energy, and matter, perhaps more, even more so. So maybe we really should be thinking of information as the most basic concept in our way of thinking about reality. So one of the ways you could cash this out is to see if you can actually get some real deep insight into quantum theory, which has long been an enigma, using the concept of information. So the problem that we face in understanding quantum theory is that we have, yes, we have a quantum mathematical framework, and we have theories built within that framework, like non-realistic quantum mechanics and quantum field theory and such. But we don't know what quantum conception of reality we should have here at the bottom. The situation in classical physics is very different because we have a classical mechanical conception of reality to guide us. And uh, you can think of the mathematics as arising from that. So the question is, what is in this box at the bottom? Obviously, this is a long debated question. Now, the strategy that I've been following for some years and is the following. That to really get insight into the quantum conception of reality, we should really try to interpose a, a set of physical principles in the middle here and try to derive quantum theory, the mathematics of quantum theory, from those physical principles. Once we've nailed down those physical principles, we've made them really, really clear, really simple, that we can then speak about them in everyday common language, not mathematical symbols. Then we can interpret those physical principles and go as it were downwards to the quantum conception of reality. That's the hope, that's the program. So essentially what, what, what I'm saying is that can we go from the left hand side, which are three really statements about measurement measurement process, and can we somehow derive the mathematics on the right hand side? So then we would have an understanding of quantum theory is really about this interface between our measurement process and reality, that's really what we would then be able to understand quantum theory as being about. And of course, we may need some other things in this box on the left-hand side, too, other informational principles. And so this program of trying to reconstruct quantum theory from informational ideas is now, uh, it's, it's, it's actually attracted a good deal of interest over the last 10, 15 years. There are a number of approaches out there I don't have time to sort of give an overview of them, so I'm just going to focus on um, a particular approach of mine, which I've been working on for the last few years. And this is deriving quantum theory from the point of view of Feynman's rules. So let me briefly outline Feynman's rules. So Feynman's rules were put forward in 1948 in this, this paper. And it's a they're an incredibly simple and yet computationally powerful way of representing the heart of quantum theory. So let's look at a simple example of a double slit experiment. So an electron starts at A and ends up at C, and here it goes through that slit or that slit, and here we have two little detectors, which are which way detectors, which detect which way the electron went. And if the probability of going this way is P1 and this way is P2, then straightforward probability theory tells us the probability of going from A to C is P1 plus P2. Now what happens if we put a large detector in there instead? So when that detector fires, it only says, well, the electron went through the slits in plural. It doesn't tell you anything more than that. Well, with our classical hat on, if we think of a particle as a, an electron as a particle moving through, we would stick to our story and say P equals P1 plus P2. But of course that's not true. Physics doesn't work like that. And so what Feynman's rules say is that we should assign a complex number, an amplitude, to each path. The total amplitude to go from A to C is given by Z1 plus Z2. That's the sum rule, the, the amplitude sum rule. The amplitude to go from A to C by the lower slit then can be computed by multiplying the amplitude of this subpath and this subpath. That's the amplitude product rule. And finally, we have the probability rule that relates these amplitudes to probabilities. So P1 is given by mod Z1 squared, P2 similarly, and Z itself is that, take the modulus squared of that, 
and you get the probability to go from A to C is given by P1 plus P2 plus an interference term. So on the Feynman uh, way of thinking about things, double slit diffraction is explained in a very simple way as a result of these simple rules. So what I want to, um, so this is the Feynman's rules in summary. And so now I want to target those rules uh, and try to derive them. So I'm going to go back to my friend the Stokiolak experiment because it's much cleaner and the outcomes are discrete. So I'm going to allow myself to possibly coarse grain the two detectors into one big detector. If that fires, I can't say whether the particle really went on the upper part of the detector or the lower part. I, I, sh I shall keep quiet about that. I shall just say the detector fired and notate it like that. So a typical experiment, which is analogous to a double slit experiment, would be like this. The system starts off life in this box, it comes out, and it causes that to fire, then that one, then that one, and I can notate it like this. Or maybe that one fires. Or I have a slightly different experiment where these two detectors are coarse grain, and in fact I get this sequence of outcomes. Now, the key part of this whole derivation is the idea that Clearly, our classical expectations fail in the double slit. Right? If you've got one big detector, the probability is not just P1 plus P2. So the idea now is to go to a deeper level of description of what's going on. So what we want to say is that in this deeper level of description, there's still a relationship between these two experiments, but it's just, it's just an indirect one. We don't see it at the probability level, but there is still a determinacy relationship at the lower level. So I formalize this as follows. So we've got these two sequences, I, I'll call them A and B, and I can formally introduce a parallel combination operator, which, so that C, I will think of as of parallel combination of A and B. So now I'm kind of creating a logic which reflects how I think reality is constituted. This, this operator is commutative, and it's also associative. As you can see, I can combine A and B together, and then combine that with C, or I can think of that another way around, A combined with B or C. I can also think of an experiment involving three measurements as two measurements, as two experiments concatenated together. So similarly, I want to be able to think of, of C, this entire sequence, as A in sequence with B. So I introduce another operator for that purpose, the two operators. That is associative, as you can imagine, very easily. There's also an interesting property of distributivity. So I can think of this sequence as A in parallel with B, and then combine that in series with C. But I can also think about that as A in series with C, B in series with C, combined in parallel. And so we end up with this distributivity relationship. This is right distributivity, but there's another relationship parallel to that, the left distributivity. So in summary, we end up with this experimental logic. And already there's this non-trivial physical thought going into this logic. I, I think this is a good candidate to the deep structure of quantum theory in the sense that it's the seed from which you can actually grow quantum theory, as I'll now try to show. So what we want to do is to See if we can derive a calculus from this logic, very much as Cox showed you could derive probability theory from Boolean logic. So that was the, that is in fact the direct inspiration for this approach. So what we want to do now is to represent our sequences in some way. We have to make a choice of representation. And so in the the, the earlier work I did, I simply represented the sequence with a pair of real numbers and said that there's a function p which, when it takes a as an argument, tells you the probability of m2 and m3 given m1. In later work, I relax this assumption. I won't go into that here. So when you make this representational choice, which again here is motivated by some physical input, the notion of complementarity, then you find that then you end up with these operators O plus, which corresponds to parallel combination, and O dot, 
which corresponds to series combination. So th this is a set of functional equations in the unknown operators, O plus and O dot. So you actually then have to solve those. So to avoid technicality, I'm not going to go into the details of how you derive them. But what you find is that you end up with that this O plus can always be, without loss of generality, expressed as a simply pairwise combination. You have to put in some additional assumptions to get there. But well, once you've assumed that, then A, O dot B has only one of five possible forms. This is probably too small to see, but this is complex multiplication, actually. And then we've got four other possibilities underneath. And now we want to figure out what this P function is, and also eliminate some of the other the possibilities we've just seen. So we require that our new calculus agree with probability theory wherever probability theory is applicable. So we take a special case of a series of atomic outcomes. We can assign amplitudes A and B here. That implies A, O dot B for the whole thing. These are the probabilities in terms of this unknown function P. And now probability theory tells us that because this is a Markov process, essentially, this relationship must hold a very simple relationship. This, too, is a functional equation in the unknown function P. We can solve it for the five cases of a, O dot B, and we end up with these functions here, where alpha and alpha and beta here are unknown constants. These two can be eliminated because it's a degenerate scalar calculus, and so we end up with these three possibilities and these three functions. Now we go back to a physical input. So, consider the situation where we do a stern girl equation, we get that result, and we repeat the measurement immediately afterwards. We must get that result. Now, if we insert a measurement which is, has a big, completely coarse grain detector in the middle, it's not at all obvious that that isn't going to disturb the repeatability. And in fact, you can show by a very simple argument that if you put your classical hat on, in general, the very fact of putting that measurement in the middle will disturb the repeatability. All you have to assume is that transition, uh, transition probabilities are symmetric. That's all you need. So it's highly non-trivial to say that this, the repeatability is not disturbed by this insertion. So, but I postulate that indeed that is the case, that putting that in doesn't disturb the repeatability. So again here, the very fact that we've got a coarse grain detector, which gives us no information about the system, is being used to motivate the idea that it doesn't disturb the system. So information gathering and disturbance is being brought in here in a very basic way. When you impose this condition, what happens is it simply eliminates these two possibilities at the bottom. You simply get complex multiplication as the only possibility, and in fact, it even fixes alpha to be two. So in fact, that's all you need to complete the derivation. So I've given you a very a rough, a very quick run through the derivation, but this is the summary, and these are Feynman's rules in the notation that I've developed. From this point, you can derive the rest of the formalism of quantum theory. I've done that in a series of following papers. So you can work out how composite systems of distinguishable systems behave. You can work out how identical particles behave that show that fermions and bosons are the only two possible ways that, that assembly of identical particles can behave. And you can derive the state formalism of quantum theory, all in a systematic way. So let me go to this, um, this picture again and, and ask, well, all right, what can we say about the quantum conception of reality here, having done this work? So the idea of the number is that we insert some physical principles here and we have we, we have reconstruction. So what can we say from these physical principles? How can we interpret quantum theory? I'll just say a few words about this. There's a lot one could say, but I'll keep it short. So in classical physics, as we also heard yesterday, the future is causally closed in the sense that the present determines the future. As a result of this structural feature, it's completely unable to deal with the past, 
present future distinction, which is such a fundamental part of the way in which we organize our experience of the world. It can't, for example, account for why we don't experience time all at once, why we're, we only experience the now, which is a, a great mystery. So there's a kind of a disconnect between the classical conception of reality and the everyday one. Now, if we follow the Eddington idea that actually our intuitive experience of past, present, and future is a reliable guide to reality, then this is very problem. So in the process view, and I'm here I'm kind of referencing Whitehead's process philosophy, which I, which I think quite well of, on this view, the future is causally open. Present simply does not determine future as an objective matter of the fact. And the passage of time involves actualization. So this measurement, the performing of measurement, and the obtaining of definite outcomes is a process of actualization, and that marks time. And one thing I should say is that in this framework, one often speaks very operationally about macroscopic measurements. But there's no reason that we need to restrict our notion of measurement to such macroscopic um, apparate, uh, ma macroscopic processes. We can think of fundamental elementary processes of actualization happening in nature all the time, whether or not human beings are involved. So there we get in quantum language to things like objective reduction, GRW collapse, and so on, collapse. So objective collapse. So in other words, actualization events are a fundamental part of the fabric of reality. So from that point of view, why measurements probabilistic? Well, probability is simply the mathematical way we, we quantify the degree to which the present state determines the future. So mathematically, we can define probability as the degree to which a proposition about the present implies a proposition about the future. And given that in Boolean logic, you can derive probability theory just as Cox did. So you could think of probability simply quantifying the degree of implication. And a colleague of mine, Kevin Knuth, who hopefully will be Skyping in tomorrow, uh, actually did some very good work along those lines. So we have, in this view, a very natural, a very, a very good fit between an ontology, which is directly suggested by this reconstruction, and our every, everyday conception. And then why complementarity? That, that's something very interesting. Right? So on the classical view, a measurement simply tells you what's there. There's, there's no choice, there's no selection in the matter. Well, as we see with quantum theory with a repeatable measurement, you have to make a cut. You learn about the same degrees of freedom at the expense of others. So on the process view, that's not entirely a surprise, at least. The process of actualization is an active intervention in, in the unfolding of reality. It's not some passive process. It's not a surprise if it somehow has some structure. And so from that view, complementarity is simply something we have discovered as physicists, as a fundamental feature of the process of actualization. And I think that's very much along the lines that Paul was thinking, that complementarity is the discovery that we've made about how reality unfolds. So I think I'll stop there and leave you with a few references. Um, this, these are more physics papers, this one, one and three. But this paper actually was written for a, a broader audience, and uh, I recommend it if you're interested in, as a starting point, if you're interested in the bigger picture. I've also written an, an introductory paper that talks about information physics broadly uh, along the lines of the first half of the talk. And you can find all the papers on my website along with recorded talks. Thank you very much for your attention.